Okay, welcome back everyone. This is the third session for our segment routing training today. This morning we were talking about the LDP and MPLS and we did the LDP and MPLS layer 3 VPN lab together. Then now in session 3 we will talk about segment routing. And by the way, for the people who did not get the socks earlier, now I brought some more along with some of my business card here. So if you would like to collect, just grab them here. In the next section, we will talk about segment routing. Here's an overview of this presentation. The presentation will focus on introduction to segment routing and its architecture. While segment routing does support both MPLS and IPv6 data plan, our tutorial and lab today are very much around segment routing with MPLS data plan or SRMPLS and how to implement traffic engineering in SRMPLS. We will cover following topics as you can see on the screen. First and foremost, we will talk about what segment routing is and where it fits into the software defined networking or SDN architectural framework. This diagram shows components that are part of the SDN architectural framework and how they can interact with each other. And segment routing sits at the data plan part of the architecture and can be configured to work with the controller for path computation in its traffic engineering application. Since SDN is a wide topic that we could actually run a separate workshop to cover it, we won't be going deeper into the SDN part in this presentation. This presentation will be mainly focusing on the segment routing only. To be short to the point, segment routing is a method of forwarding packets based on the source routing, where the routing path is encoded in the packet header as an ordered list of segments. As a result of this, the intermediate nodes do not need to keep the network state. In addition, it allows centralized computation of the path through an SDN controller or other tools that can generate and apply the path configuration to the routers. As mentioned earlier, this presentation and the upcoming lab are both focusing on SRMPLS, so it is essential to understand how MPLS works before we can go into the detail and how to implement segment routing with MPLS data plan. Uh, just a quick survey here. How many of you have attended the MPLS session this morning? Can you raise your hand? Okay. So approximately 60%. Do I need to go through MPLS again? Or some of you already know about MPLS? Maybe I'll just quickly <laughs> go through the slides. Yeah, because some are, maybe some are redundant with this morning. MPLS stands for Multi-Protocol Level Switching. It is a tunneling mechanism that supports several types of payload, and therefore it is multi-protocol. MPLS forwarding works based on a concept of forwarding equivalence class, or FEC, which is a group of packets that need to be forwarded in an identical manner. Each FEC is assigned an MPLS level, which is a 20-bit value. Packets are classified into individual FEC at ingress point of the MPLS network, and an MPLS level corresponding to the FEC is added to the packet. And the intermediate hops swap the label and forward the packet toward their next hops. The initial motivation of having MPLS was back in mid-1990s. At the time, the standard way of IP routing, which looks up the destination address of the packet against the IP forwarding table, was considered more complex and time-consuming. Because IP address lookup typically uses the method of logical N plus the longest match. So the processing power at that age was not as good as now. Imagine if a router needs to forward millions of packets then it will require relatively powerful hardware to support this process. That's why the idea of label switching come from here. If we can forward the packet with a simpler header that does not require the process of logical N plus the longest match, it would greatly improve the performance. 
And that's why starting from 1996, Epsilon, Cisco, and IBM announced the level switching plan. Until now, there are 280 or more requests for comments or RFC for MPLS technologies. With the MPLS technology, core routers in the network no longer need to look up the destination address of the packet. They can forward the packets more efficiently based on the simplified MPLS header. While the initial motivation of MPLS was for solving performance issue of IP routing, but nowadays this one is no longer an issue because the modern hardware is more powerful. And therefore, the main use case of MPLS shifted from level switching to multi-protocol. Instead of using it to speed up packet switching, yeah, and also modern hardware, it, it is more powerful, so there is no need for using MPLS just for speeding up this. So now MPLS is more used for providing multiple services such as using a single core network to provide like global internet, IP VPN, layer 2 VPN, or other specific bandwidth guarantee or low latency products. An MPLS label is the core of all the MPLS technology. It is a four by header encapsulated between layer two and layer three. That's why some people also call it layer 2.5. It contains four fields, 20 bit label, and a three bit traffic class, and a one bit bottom of stack, and eight bit time to live value. Technically, multiple levels can be used in the packet encapsulation. This is known as MPLS level stack. And the bottom of stack field of the last MPLS level will be set to one, while the other levels will have zero. Some MPLS applications, such as VPN or traffic engineering, will need more than one level. For example, for layer 3 VPN will require two labels. One is the transport label that transport the packet from PE to PE. Another one will be the VPN label, or also known as a service label, that for identifying the customer. There are three possible operations when an MPLS packet is received by the router before forwarding to the next hub. Push is the operation of adding a new MPLS level to the packet. Swap is an operation of replacing the topmost level, and pop is the operation of removing the topmost level. This is a simple diagram showing how a router processes regular IP and MPLS packet. Basically, for IP, it will use routing protocol to build a routing information base and forwarding information base, which are RIP and FIP. And for MPLS, we can use the protocol like Label Distribution Protocol or LDP to build the Label Information Base. And then it will work together with Routing Information Base to further populate the Label Forwarding Information Base or LFIP. And when an incoming packet is an IP packet, the router will perform destination lookup and forward it based on FIP. When an incoming packet is an MPLS packet, or it is an IP packet that has an MPLS forwarding entry, then the router will forward it based on LFIP. An LFIP has following table entries. A next hop level forwarding entry, or an HLFE, is used for forwarding the lab belt packet. It contains next hop, lab belt operation, and link layer encapsulation information. An incoming label map or ILM is a mapping between an incoming label to a set of NHLFEs. And a FAC to NHLFE map or FTN is used for forwarding unlabeled packets. It maps each FAC into a set of NHLFEs. There are some MPLS terminologies that we need to be familiar with, like Level switch router, LSR, is a generic term for any router that supports MPLS. While level edge router or LER, in some cases, it is known as HLSR. It is an LSR that operates at the edge of the MPLS network, basically at the e ingress point and egress point of the MPLS network. 
an LER that perform push operation is known as ingress LER or ILER. It is the entry point of the MPLS network. And an LER that performs pop operation is known as an egress LER or ELER. ELER is the exit point of the MPLS network. Level switch path or LSP is a path taken by MPLS packet from ILER to ELER, basically from ingress point to egress point. This is the LSP. For the scenario of MPLS VPN, an LSR that performs only swap operation is known as a P router or a provider router. And an area that performs push or pop operation is known as a provider H or PE router. Level switch path is a path taken between PE, ingress PE to another egress PE. In order to establish an MPLS LSP for each destination, routers along the path will need to exchange level information with each other. There are a few protocols that commonly used for level distribution, such as level distribution protocol or LDP, and resource reservation protocol with traffic engineering extension or RSVPTE, and multi-protocol border gateway protocol or MPBGP. Levels are typically allocated from downstream to upstream routers. And besides the transport levels that are used for establishing an LSP, some MPLS services such as MPLS VPN will require to use the service levels to identify different services offered by the PE. These service levels are commonly advertised by MPBGP with either VPN v4, VPN v6, or L2 VPN address families, depending on what kind of VPN you are doing. If it is the IPv4, IP VPN, it will be VPN v4 unicast. If it is the layer 2 VPN, it will be layer 2 VPN address family. Here's a quick summary and comparison between IP, native Ethernet, and MPLS technologies. Actually, I went through these earlier this morning, so I will not repeat Again, maybe you can refer to the slide for comparison. In order to set up LSPs for traffic forwarding, the transport level for each forwarding equivalence class need to be distributed to the routers along the path. LDP and RSVPTE are commonly used for distributing the transport levels. As I said earlier, transport level will be LDP, RS, VPT, while VPN level will be VGP. The sample diagram on this slide shows an example of how levels are distributed hop by hop through LDP. Every router assigns a local level for the destination of PE2. In this case, we are uh, showing for the PE2. We can assume that it is the PE2's loopback address. The local level is also known as an incoming level or in level. It is the level that the router expects to see on incoming packet for that specific fact. In addition to the in level, the router will also receive outgoing level or out levels from its LDP peer. So basically, it will propagate the level hop by hop, and then the router will receive and will use this information to build the MPLS forwarding table. Once the LSP is set up, the routers can then forward packets based on the level forwarding information base or LFIP. This diagram shows an example of MPLS forwarding of an MPLS VPN service for connectivity between CE1 and CE2. For the VPN service, MPLS requires more, one or more service level. A minimum will be one, but in some cases can be more than one which are typically advertised by MPBGP. Let's assume that the service level in this VPN is 1234, because some of you might want to know what is this 1234 uh, MPLS level. We just assume it is the VPN level and advertised by BGP. In terms of packet encapsulation, the transport levels are always on top of the service level because Unlike the transport level that need to be examined and processed hop by hop, 
the service levels only need to be understood by the PE routers. So the P router in the middle, actually they don't really need to know what those service levels are. They simply swap the packet with the transport level. And based on this example, we can see PE1 is pushing two levels, one, two, three, four for the VPN service and 400 for the LSP to PE2. Along the path, all P routers will perform only swap operation to the transport level until when the packet arrives at PE2, PE2 will pop the transport level and then process the service level and forward the packet to the relevant VPN customer link. This service level is used for identifying specific customer on that PE because technically one PE can support many customers. So each customer, they will have different service level and the traffic will be forwarded based on that. And by the way, some of you who have learned MPLS before might want to know why P3 did not pop the level before sending to P2. Because the current example is showing the situation when penultimate hop popping is not used. And in contrast to the previous example, this one is the example that penultimate hop popping or PHP is used. When penultimate hop popping is used, then the, the P3 here will eventually pop the level, will not forward the, the MPLS packet to P2 anymore. And in the case of VPN also, it will pop the level and will forward the packet with only one level to PE2, which is the VPN level, because this is with penultimate hop popping. Penultimate hop means this one. This is the ultimate hop, the last hop. Penultimate is the one before the last hop, and then it will pop the level. This is to avoid PE2 to do additional steps for forwarding. Here are some observations on LDP. LDP forwarding follows the IGP short test path. There is no traffic engineering capability. And all nodes install an ILM entry for every LDP destination. A single LDP level associated with the destination is required to transport the packet. LDP are assigned by downstream router, meaning the level that a router uses for MPLS forwarding lookup is the, the level that assigned by the router itself. LDP level changes at each hop as levels are locally significant. It is not always, but most of the time you will see they are using different levels because maybe it is, it is rare to have all the routers assign all the levels with the same order. So that's why in LDP, usually from hop to hop, you will see the level changes. The reason why I mentioned about this because upcoming we will talk about segment routing and then in segment routing, the level will not change. Besides LDP, RSVPTE is also commonly used for signaling an LSP. RSVPTE was designed with traffic engineering capability in place. So we can set up a traffic engineering LSP which takes a different path from the IGP short test path. For example, in this case, from PE1 to PE2, the short test path can be go through here or go through here. It can be ECMP, but here because of the metric is 100, so the short test path should be going through here. But with RSVPTE, we can establish an LSP this way. We can specify the path. In our example here, instead of going directly through P1, P2, P3 to PE2, PE1 would like to go to PE2 through P1, P2, P5, and P6. This requirement can be included in the RSVPTE path message, which is a request for the resource reservation. The router that initiates the request is known as the head end router, and the router along the path are the midpoint routers and the destination of the LSP is a tail end router. A path message will travel hop by hop from head end to tail end. So PE1 who requests for this LSP, PE1 is the head end, and then PE2 is the tail end, while the router along the path 
P1, P2, P5, P6, they are the midpoint routers. If everything is fine, a reservation message will be sent back from the tail end to the head end. And the reservation message is like a confirmation for the requested resources. It also contains the label assignment for the LSP. All nodes along the path will need to record the state of each and every resource reservation. So this one, you can see the difference. In LDP, it is following IGP path. So we just need to record the level for each destination. But with RSVPTE, all the nodes along the path will need to take note of each and every reservation. For the forwarding part, because both are using MPLS forwarding, so the concept is quite similar. In this case, the service level is one, two, three, four. PE1 will push the label, then P1, P2, P5, P6 will swap the label, and PE2 will top the labels. However, unlike LDP, RSVP, TE, signal, LSPs are unidirectional point-to-point -point tunnel by its nature. This means full mesh, full mesh tunneling between two nodes will require two LSPs. Here, only two nodes, so two LSP. And then if we have three nodes, there will be six LSPs because it is full mesh. And for four nodes, we will need 12 LSPs. For five nodes, will be 20 LSPs. We can use this formula of n multiply n minus one to calculate the total number of LSPs required for full mesh tunneling between n nodes. Based on the calculation here, we can see there are, if there are 10 nodes in the network, it requires 90 LSPs. And when there are 100 nodes, the number of LSP will significantly grow up to 9,900. So it is not scalable. That's why here are some observations on RSVPTE. It allows the construction of arbitrary path other than the short test path based on traffic engineering requirement. But for two nodes to communicate, the RSVP LSP needs to be signaled in both direction. And along the way, all the intermediate nodes, the midpoint routers will need to maintain the status of this tunnel. So that's why if you have 9,900 tunnels, then it means that many routers along the path might need to keep the status up to this amount of tunnels. Here is a comparison between different protocols that can distribute MPLS labels. Uh, I will highlight the main point. For the complexity, LDP is low while RSVPT is high. Because LDP, basically, you just need to enable it, and it will automatically discover the neighbors. It will distribute the label. But it doesn't have the traffic engineering capability. The traffic engineering is no. While RSVPTE, it is complex, but it does support traffic engineering. And for BGP, it is medium, but actually BGP is mainly used for advertising the service levels. There are some cases that BGP can be used for advertising the transport levels, such as seamless MPLS. But most of the time in the IGP, it will be mainly LDP and RSVPTE for establishing the LSP between two routers in the network. Now we know the advantages and disadvantages of LDP and RSVPTE. LDP is simpler and more scalable, but it doesn't have traffic engineering capability. On the other hand, RSVPTE supports traffic engineering, but it faces scalability issue when there are more nodes in the MPLS network. Ideally, we want to have a solution that we can do traffic engineering and does not need to track the state of each and every LSP. Guess what? It is segment routing. Finally, our main actor up here now. Yeah, we, we have been talking so long, we arrived at segment routing. Segment routing is defined by the spring or source packet routing in networking working group of the IETF. It enables the ability for a node to specify a forwarding path 
other than the normal short test path that a particular packet will traverse. And it benefits several network functions such as network virtualization, network link path and node protection, fast reroute, network programmability, OAM techniques, simplification and reduction of the network signaling component, load balancing and traffic engineering. While segment routing has a lot of capabilities, in our training today, we will focus on network virtualization, signaling, and traffic engineering part. In fact, this uh, segment routing, if we will conduct a full training for segment routing, we can take up to five days because uh, totally we have, uh, I believe, two presentations with 300 plus slides each. So today I try to trim it down to, to fit with the time that we have and focus on the main point that we can use segment routing. There are two key requirements behind segment routing. It must allow the incremental and selective deployment without requiring a flag day or massive upgrade of all network elements. And it must also allow putting policy state in the packet header instead of letting the intermediate node track it like RSVPPE. There should be no policy state in the midpoints and tail ends. Segment routing leverages the concept of source routing, where the source of the packet includes routing information within the packet itself. This is different from hop-by-hop -hop destination based routing, where each intermediate point decides how a packet needs to be forwarded. Segment routing supports MPLS and IPv6 data plan. Segment routing with MPLS data plan is known as SR MPLS. It's, it uses the existing MPLS forwarding mechanism without modification. This is the reason why before going into segment routing, I spent two sessions for saying what MPLS is and how MPLS works. Another one would be segment routing with IPv6. It is known as SRV6. It is achieved by the use of new IPv6 routing header. This presentation will mainly focus on SR MPLS. So how does segment routing work? Basically, the source determines the path a packet should take and encode the path information within the packet as a sequence of segment or instructions. Each segment or instruction that we mentioned here can be a node or an adjacency. When the segment is a node, it means that to take the IGP short test path to that node. And when the segment is an adjacency, it means to send the packet to that specific link anyway, regardless of IGP metric and short test path. The path information is directly encapsulated on the packet rather than needing to have a specific protocol to maintain and keep track of it, like RSVPTE. We need to have this protocol running and then all the intermediate nodes need to take note of it. And with segment routing, we don't need this anymore. Routers along the path will only inspect the segment list and forward the packet according to the instruction on the packet. No state information needs to be tracked by the intermediate routers. There are several use cases of segment routing. First and the simplest one would be to replace LDP as an alternative MPLS level distribution protocol. MPLS levels for segment routing are advertised by interior gateway protocols like OSPF and ISIS. This eliminates the need for running an additional protocol like LDP just for distributing level based on the IGP path. So the simplest one would be if you don't want to run LDP and then you also don't need any specific function of traffic engineering, you simply enable segment routing also okay. It can replace LDP and advertise the level. Another use case is fast reroute. Segment routing does support fast reroute in any topology. It's free computation and setup of backup path does not require any additional signaling protocol other than regular IGP or BGP. It supports backup path setup with shared risk constraint, node protection, link protection, and micro loop avoidance. Probably today we might not go very deep into the fast reroute because it is also another topic that we can spend hours to discuss about that. There are many technologies involved behind. 
we will focus on traffic engineering part today. Yeah, one of the biggest selling point of segment routing is traffic engineering. It supports loose and strict path option, bandwidth emission control, distributed and centralized path computation models. This one, the centralized path computation model means you might have a controller or another application that compute the path and then instruct to the router to signal it. And also it has other capability like disjointness in dual plan network, egress peer engineering. This is a BGP function that you, you push the traffic toward a specific BGP peer. Load balancing among non-parallel links, such as links connected to different adjacent neighbors, limited if not zero per service state and signaling on midpoint and tail end routers. And it does support ECMP, capacity planning. It looks like there are many terms here, but some of them are actually not within the scope today. If you are interested in specific terms and would like to read more details about them, please refer to the RFC 7855 source packet routing in networking problem statement and requirements. In the case of SDN scenario, there are some key requirements for typical segment routing implementation when used with SDN controller, such as the ability to explicitly route traffic with or without ECMP, fast reroute on link or node failures along the path, no signaling state in intermediate nodes between head end and tail end. All policy state is maintained only in the head end and the packet itself. The ability for, pol for policy to be changed in near real time by the SDN controller. You can see if in the case of not using a controller, let's say just simple MPLS traffic engineering with manual configuration, then the, the biggest benefit of using segment routing would be the midpoint routers and the tail end routers do not need to maintain the status of the tunnel, not like RSVPTE. So even if you have thousands of LSPs, then only the head end will need to know about that. Okay, so now we know what segment routing does and where it comes from. Next, we will talk about its architecture and some important terminologies. Segment routing or SR allows a node to steer packet through an SR policy, which is an order list of instruction. These instructions are called segments. Segments can represent any type of instruction. They can be topological instruction like nodes or adjacency or instruction about services and applications. I remember in the first day of APEN, there was some discussion about now we can actually write code in the packet. Actually, segment routing has the capability to support some specific instruction besides the topological instruction. For example, you want the router to do one, two, three, then you can write the instruction on the packet. And then when it arrives to the destination router, it will trigger this function to run. And Anyway, this is beyond the scope of today. The semantics of a segment can only be local to an SR node or global within the SR domain. Segment routing allows steering of flow without requiring per flow state at intermediate points in the network. While the protocol like RSVPTE, all nodes along the path will need to keep track of the status of the path. It is supported on two data plans, MPLS and IPv6. They are known as SRMPLS and SRv6, respectively. For SRMPLS, it works with existing MPLS forwarding. Segments are encoding, encoded as MPLS labels, and the entire list of segments is encoded as a stack of MPLS labels. That's why earlier when I was talking about MPLS, I was saying that in segment routing, we must have levels because it will have a segment list. Let's say if the segment list has many nodes inside, then we will have many levels in the stack. The active segment is the top level of the stack. 
On the other hand, SRV6 uses a new IPv6 extension header called the Segment Routing Header or SRH. Segments are encoded as IPv6 addresses and the entire list of the segment are encoded as an order list of IPv6 addresses in the segment routing header. The active segment is the IPv6 destination address. Along the way, I will mention about in SRMPLS how it will be, in SRV6 how it will be, but mainly today our focus will be on MPLS part. Okay, terminology time. Normally terminology time, you will need to memorize many things and we'll have a lot of question mark in the mind. Segment is an instruction. A node executes on an incoming packet. For example, to forward the packet according to the shortest path to the destination or forward the packet through a specific interface or deliver the packet to a given service or application. Here to forward packet according to the shortest path to destination, this one is typically if the segment is a node. And then to forward packet through the specific interface, this is the situation where a segment is an interface connecting to the neighboring router, which we call an adjacency segment. And then for delivering the packet to a given service or application, this is the case that I said to trigger a function at the destination router. The global segment is the segment that is supported by all SR capable routers in the SR domain, while a local segment is the segment that only supported by the router originating it. The segment identifier or SID or we call SID is for identifying a segment. It is an MPLS level in SRMPLS and it is an IPv6 address in SRv6. The level value of seed in SRMPLS can either be an absolute value or a calculated value based on a unique index. This one I will explain more later in the presentation, in which case we will use a unique index, in which case we will use an absolute value. SR policy, also known as segment list, is an order list of seeds, encoding the order set of instruction to be applied to a packet as it traverses an SR domain. So basically, it, it is a list of uh, segments. And then in MPLS case, it will be encoded as the label stack in MPLS. And for IPv6, it will be a list of IPv6 addresses in segment routing header of the IPv6 packet. The segment list can either be computed locally or provisioned by a remote system. When provisioned by a remote system, it can be provisioned using like NetCon or a protocol called Path Computation Element Communication Protocol, PCEP. It is the protocol that can be used on the controller to signal the specific path to the uh, head end router. SR domain is a set of nodes participating in the source-based routing model. Still many terms. Okay. SR global block or SRGB is a set of local MPLS levels reserved for the global segment. In the case of IPv6, SR with IPv6, SRGB is the set of global SRV6 seeds in the SR domain. For SR local block or SRLB, it's a set of local MPLS levels reserved for a local segment. In the case of SRv6, SRLB is the set of local IPv6 addresses reserved for local SRv6 seats. And the active segment is the segment that is used by the receiving router to process the packet. Normally in SRMPLS, the active segment will be the top level of the MPLS level stack, and in SRV6, it will be the destination address of the IPv6 packet. Segment list depth refers to the number of segments in the segment list. So if you have uh, three segments, then the depth is three. When a packet comes into an SR node, it will perform one of these three operations. Actually, when we see here, uh, it is very similar to MPLS. That's why there is a comparison here. For the segment routing, we use the term push, next, continue. 
while MPLS is push, pop, and swap. So for the push operation in segment routing, when implemented in MPLS data plan, it becomes the push operation of MPLS, while next is pop operation and continue is the swap operation. Push is an operation of inserting a segment at the top of the segment list. In SRMPLS, the router will push a new label to the label stack. And in SRV6, the router will set the first segment in the IPv6 segment routing header. Next is an operation of signaling completion of active segment and activate the next segment in the segment list. In SRMPLS, it is popping the top level of the stack. And in SRV6, the router will activate the next segment in the segment routing header by copying it to the destination address field of the IPv6 header. Continue is an operation of signaling that the current active segment is not yet complete and needs to remain active. In SRMPLS, the router will swap the top level. In SRV6, the router will do standard IPv6 forwarding based on the destination address. If it sounds complicated to you, actually it is simple. Push Normally, we, we do this on the head end router. And then next, normally it is at the tail end router or maybe at the intermediate point that we need to change the segment. It arrived to a point that we need to change. Let's say we are saying that from PE1 to PE2, the, you need to go to P3 first. So when arrived to P3, the next operation will happen because P3 will pop the level and then, and then it will continue to process the next segment. Continue means along the along the way to to the destination of the level. The destination for in case of IPv6, it is the destination of the uh, segment. Segment routing provides flexible support of distributed, centralized, or hybrid control plan options. A distributed control plan means the segments are allocated and distributed by routing protocol like ISIS, OSPF, or BGP. On the other hand, a centralized control plan refers to scenario where the segments are allocated and instantiated by an SR controller communicated with the router either through NetCon, PC, BGP, or other means. If, let's say, the controller does not speak any of this protocol, then maybe the controller can simply SSH into the router and configure the command. It is also possible. It, it doesn't have the restriction saying that the controller must speak these protocols. The hybrid option is a combination of distributed and centralized control plans. IGP segments are used for identifying information advertised by an IGP in the context of a prefix, topology, and algorithm. The advertisement of IGP segment is done via IGP extension for segment routing. There are two main categories for IGP segment, the IGP prefix and IGP adjacency segments. An IGP prefix segment also known as a prefix seed, represent an IGP prefix. It can be an IGP anycast segment or anycast seed that represents an anycast prefix or an IGP node, or we call node seed, that it identifies specific router. An IGP adjacency segment, also known as adjacency seed, represents an IGP adjacency. In another word, it identifies a specific interface connecting to the neighboring router. We will dive into each type of seed in the coming slides. So basically, uh, adjacency is for identifying the link, while prefix seed is for identifying either a node or the, an anycast destination. So for example, in segment routing, if you are saying that I want to go to PE2 through router P3, so this so-called router P3 is a node seed. You don't care how, how it will go to P3. Maybe it will take the short test part. You just want it to arrive to P3 with the short test part. Then it will be a node seed. But maybe when arrive to P3, in this P3 might have multiple interface 
connect to the neighboring router. So in that case, if you want to say that in P3, you must use gigabit Ethernet one to go to the next hub, then it will be an adjacency seat. This is for specifying the instruction for a link. This is for specifying instruction for a node. A node seat is used for identifying a specific node in the network. They are globally significant by default. Node seats are essentially instruction to forward a packet via the short test ECMP aware IGP path to the destination node. Node seats are advertised by the link state IGP like OSPF for ISIS. They need to be manually configured by the network operator on NMS. An anycast seat is advertised by all the members of an anycast set. All routers in the set advertise the same anycast prefix and seat value. They are globally significant by default. And anycast seat are essentially instruction to forward a packet through the short test path to the topological closest member of the anycast set. So it means if you have an anycast set of four routers, so you just tell the router say that the head end router saying that you just forward the packet to any of these four routers. I don't care which one, the closest one you just forward it. Then this is an anycast seat. Anycast seats are advertised by the link state IGP like OSPF and ISIS. For adjacency seat, it is used for identifying one or more adjacency in specific node. The node typically allocates one adjacency seat for each of its adjacency. It may also allocate multiple adjacency seats to the same adjacency or the same adjacency seat to multiple adjacency for the purpose of ECMP. Adjacency seats are locally significant by default. They are installed only in the fifth of the originating router. This requires the adjacency seat to be preceded by the node seat of its node to allow the correct forwarding. For example, if you want to say to P3, say that you forward the packet through gigabit Ethernet 1 to the next router, then at least you will need to give the instruction for the packet to arrive to P3 first. Otherwise, other router will not know gigabit Ethernet 1. That's why here we mentioned about the adjacency seat needs to be proceeded by the node seat. It needs to arrive to a certain node that can recognize this adjacency. Otherwise, it cannot be processed correctly. This requirement can be avoided by using a globally significant adjacency seat at the expense of having additional state in the network. Yes, if you assign it globally, then other routers also will identify this, but all the other routers will need to receive and keep this information. Adjacency seats are essentially instructions to forward packet through a specific interface, regardless of IGP metric or the short test path consideration. It is like a policy saying that you have to forward the packet out this interface, no matter what IGP cost it has, or no matter which next hop the short test path takes. In addition to node seed, any cast seed, and adjacency seed, there is also another kind of seed called binding seed. A binding seed is bound to an SR policy, which may be expanded to a list of seeds. It can either be locally or globally significant. When a packet is sent through the network, the binding seed is used to identify the service or function that the packet should be directed. It is used in conjunction with other segments, such as prefix seeds and node seeds to establish a path that directs traffic across the network. Upon receiving a packet with a binding seat as the top level, the router will pop the binding seat and then post relevant seats that are associated to that binding seat. Uh, to me, I feel binding seat is like a function in programming that was programmed to do specific action. We can call the function whenever we want to do those actions without needing to rewrite the code. For example, you, you create a binding seat and saying that when the router receives this seed, then expand it to become following list of segments. So the router, when receive this packet, it will pop the seed and then it will impose the segment that you predefined. It is like a function in programming.
Besides the IGP segments, there are also some BGP segments that ingress for the router of an AS can steer a flow along a selected AS toward a selected egress for the router of the AS and through a specific peer by using BGP egress peer engineering or EPE capabilities. BGP segments are classified as two categories. They can be a BGP peering segment that are recognized by BGP EPE enable node for inter-domain path selection or BGP prefix segment that identify the specific BGP prefix. A BGP peering segment can be a peer node segment represents a BGP peering node. A peer adjacency segment represents an adjacency to a BGP peering node or a peer set adjacency segment that represents a set of BGP peering nodes. Basically, this one is for the ingress for the router to select how you will forward the packet out to the neighbor AS. Let's say you want to use a specific link through a specific AS for this destination, then it can be implemented with this BGP seed. For supporting BGP prefix seed, a new optional transitive BGP attribute is created for announcing the level information. It was originally defined for SRMPLS, but now extended for SRV6. A BGP prefix segment is a BGP prefix which has a BGP prefix seed attribute attached on it. This is applicable to the MP, BGP, IPv4, or IPv6 level unicast prefixes. The label associated with the prefix is encoded in the NLRI of the BGP update using two BGP type lang values or TLV, the label index TLV and the originator sRGB TLV. The label index TLV contains the label index value for the associated BGP prefix. It is a hint to the upstream BGP speaker about the incoming label to use for the prefix. And the original sRGB TLV is an optional and contain information about the sRGB of the node originating the BGP prefix. It is an optional TLV. Ah, we finished the terms. There are many terms. But in reality, you don't have to memorize all of them. Because the, the main focus that we, we will talk about today, mainly the node seeds and the, the adjacency seeds. Just, just remember this. Node seeds for identifying specific nodes and adjacency seeds for identifying specific interface. And we will make use of these in our lab. After trying to memorize many terminology and component of the segment routing in the previous part of the presentation, now we will get into something more practical, which is how the encapsulation and packet forwarding will work for segment routing with MPLS data plan or SRMPLS. When implementing SRMPLS, a segment is encoded as an MPLS label and an order list of segment is encoded as a stack of label. The active segment is the topmost level, and there is no change to the operation of the standard MPLS data plan for supporting segment routing. So actually, it will work the same for MPLS. Simply three operations, post, swap, and pop. For SRMPLS, Earlier, I think we mentioned about sRGB. It is a set of local MPLS label reserved for global segment. While it is a node-specific property, means this one, it can be different in every router. It is a global block. It is like the label range that we reserve for assigning the segment routing labels. It can be configured differently on different router, but normally to simplify the network operation, you can configure all nodes to be the same, then it, it is easier, it is simpler. I will give the example why. In this example here, the range is uh, 16384 up to 32767.
S R L B, as the name indicated, it is a set of local MPLS level reserve for local segments. And then in this example, this is the range. This range can be configured, but here I will say why we should configure to be the same throughout the network. Let's have a look at an example of label advertisement of an SR domain with a common sRGB range. Common sRGB range means every router we configure the same range. In this example, all nodes are configured with identical sRGB range and advertise only node seeds. All node seeds are allocated as absolute globally significant MPLS level values. There are three nodes in this network, P1, P2, and P3. Each node assigns an absolute level for its loopback address. For example, P1 assigns 101 for its loopback, and P2 assigns 102, and P3 assigns 103 for its loopback. This slide is showing the LFIP entry for the node seat of P3 on each node. Since all nodes sit in the same, in, in this example, are absolute levels, so every node will install exactly the same level for each individual node seat. We can see no matter in P1, P2, or P3, for forwarding to the node seat of P3, the level will be always 103. So this is the point. When we configure the same level range, then we can use an absolute value here. So we can say that for P3, 103. For P2, 102. For P1, 101. So no matter which router, it will always use the same level for forwarding to P3. That's why if you capture the packet, you will see when the packet traverses hop by hop, the level is not changed. It will be always 103, 103, 103 until arriving to P3. This slide is showing the LFIP entry for the node set of P2 on each node. Same as the previous slide, all nodes are using 102 for forwarding to the node set of P2. Yeah, because they all are using the same range. So this 102 is within the range of all the routers. That's why we can use uh, an absolute value for P2. That's why no matter on P1's forwarding table or P2 or P3, all the levels will be 102. In level is 102, our level also 102. In reality, they do the, the swap operation, but because they are swapping from 102 to 102, so it looks like they, they are not changing the level. Same here for all nodes that are using 101 for forwarding to the node seat of P1. Yeah, so this is simple for segment routing with the same range. If you are using the same sRGB range, you can use absolute value, just assign a number for each specific node, then this number will be globally significant throughout the S SR domain. And then when you do the trace route, also when you see level 101, you know it is destined for P1. When you see level 102, you know it is going to P2. It's easy for troubleshooting also. That's why it is straightforward to have the same sRGB range throughout the SR domain. And in the case, the node in the same domain are having different sRGB ranges. Then in this case, the absolute value cannot be used. There might be some reason, for example, you are running different platforms that their, their supported ranges are not the same. Then in that case, you cannot use the absolute value. Then we need to use a globally unique index instead. So in this case, not an absolute value anymore. It will be an index. And based on this globally unique index value, each node will calculate its own local level by adding the index on top of the start of its range. Okay, let's see some examples. For example, node A and node B are having different sRGB range configurations. In this case, if we happen to assign an absolute level value, this value may be covered by node A, but not node B, or may be covered by node B, but not node A. Because you can see they are having totally different range. The range 
the ranges are not overlapping with each other. So if we assign a value that covered by A, it will not be covered by B. Then we'll have problem. To solve this, we can assign an index instead of an absolute value. Let's say we assign an index of 100. It means that no matter what your sRGB range is, simply add 100 on top of the beginning of the range and assign your local level for this C. In our example here, note A's sRGB range is 163842327767. After adding an index of 100, its local level for the seat will become 16484. In contrast, Node B's sRGB range is 65536 to 131071. After adding an index of 100, the local level will be 65636. So you can see, simply we use the beginning of the range at this index of 100. Then we will get the local level value for each router. This is in the case that the routers are not having the same range. Here is an example of level advertisement with different sRGB ranges. Same as in the previous example. For simplicity, we will use only the node seat to demonstrate this. And all the node seats are now allocated as the unique index values instead of the absolute values. This is because all nodes are having different sRGB configuration. So we can have a look at this diagram. There are totally three nodes, P1, P2, and P3. Each node assigns a unique index for its loopback address. P1 assigns index number one for its loopback. P2 assigns index number two, and P3 assigns index number three. Oh, the text might be small, but you can see here, index one, index two, index three that they assign for their loopbacks. And the slide is showing the L5 entry for the node seat of P3 on all the nodes. Since all the nodes in this example are the unique index values, so every node will calculate its own level for each individual node seat based on the sRGB range configuration. We can see that P1 figure out that it should use 103 and P2 use 203 and P3 uses 303. Because the range of P1 is 100, so for the destination P3, the index is 3. That's why 100 plus 3 will become 103. And then for P2, its range is 200. So 200 plus 3 will be 203. For P3, its range is 300. That's why 300 plus 3 will be 303. And then finally, when they are coordinated, P1 will say, my in level is 103, but when I send to P2, P2 is expecting 203. And then P2 is saying that my, my level is 203, but when forward to P3, it is expecting 303. Basically, the level is calculated instead of being an absolute value like in the previous example. This is the L5 for P2, P2 loopback. Yeah, the same concept. The labels are calculated based on the own range. And same here, that all nodes are using different label values as they have different sRGB range. Just now we talk about node seeds, which are the transport levels for forwarding to a specific node. How about the service level like MPLS VPN? There is no change for this part. No matter with LDP, RS, VPTE, or SR MPLS, MPBGP is still the protocol for exchanging service level in MPLS VPN scenario. So basically what we did earlier in session two, we did LDP plus MPLS VPN with the VPN v4 unicast address family. When we implement segment routing, the BGP part does not change. Basically, we just remove LDP, put in segment routing, then the BGP part remains the same and it will work the same. Now we understand how nodes are assigning the labels in segment routing. We will move on to see segment routing use cases with different scenarios. Use case one is the ECMP aware short test path routing. 
node seeds are allocated and advertised with absolute labels as all nodes in the SR domain are having identical range. We will use only node seeds to demonstrate this and then they will be absolute labels because of identical sRGB range. Our objective is to deliver traffic between PE1 and PE2 through the short test IGP path. For simplicity, all IGP metrics are set to 10 by default unless otherwise indicated. So on, on this topology, if we did not mention about the IGP metric, it will be 10, 10, 10, 10, except this one is 100. As we can see in the diagram, the link between P5 and 6 has a metric of 100. So as a result of this, the short test path from PE1 to PE2 is through P1, P2, and P3. Since the node seeds are globally significant absolute levels, the MPLS level for reaching PE2 is the same in all nodes. Because this one, we just want to reach to PE2 with the short test path. So it is similar to what we do in LDP. Then we don't need to put multiple seeds. Then in this case, we just need to put the destination seed of uh, 222 for reaching PE2. And then because of they are having the same, the common sRGB range, that's why in each and every node, they have the same level for reaching to PE2. Basically, PE1 will impose the level of P222, and then when P arrive to P1, P1 will swap it from 222 to 222, and then continue. Here also will swap from 222 to 222, and then finally this one also will do the same. The actual traffic forwarding will look like this. In fact, there is a swap operation happen in P1, P2, and P3, but they are just swapping from 222 to 222. That's why we feel the level did not change. Use case two has similar setup as use case one, except now each node has different range of sRGB. Therefore, we can no longer use the absolute level and we need to use the index values. The objective is pretty much the same as use case one, it is to deliver traffic between PE1 and PE2 through the short test path. All point-to-point -point links have an IGP metric of 10, except the link between P5 and P6. So the short test path is the same through P1, P2, and P3 to PE2. Since each router has its own sRGB range, so we are using index value rather than absolute values. Every node needs to calculate the level values based on their sRGB range plus the index. And as a result of this, the level values for the same node seed are different along the path because they are having different range. We can see PE1 pushes 222 for reaching PE2. When the packet arrives at P1, it swept from 222 to 322. And when it arrives at P2, it swept from 322 to 422. And when arrived at P3, it swept from 422 to 822. The MPLS forwarding operation are actually the same, no matter for absolute levels or index values. The only difference would be the change of level value in each hop due to the different sRGB range. Actually, the forwarding mechanism is the same, but we just see the level change when the range is different. But when the range is the same, then it looks like always 222 along the path to the destination. In use case three, we will demonstrate a traffic engineering path using segment routing. Same to use case one, the node seats are allocated and advertised with absolute levels. So in this use case, it will be absolute levels, not the index. Because all nodes in the SR domain having identical sRGB range. Unlike the setting in use case one and two, all IGP metrics in this use case is 10 without exception, which means the IGP short test path from PE1 to PE2 should be an ECMP through P1, P2, P3, and P4, P5, P6. 
I mean, in case we don't do traffic engineering, if we just take the shortest path to the destination, from here to here, there are two ways to go. Can be this way and this way because they they are having the same metric. Here is 10, 10, 10, 10, so 40. And here is 10, 10, 10, 10, also 40. So it will be ECMP. However, the objective of this use case is to establish a traffic engineering LSP for PE1 to reach PE2 through P2, but avoid the point-to-point -point link between P2 and P3. So the requirement, we need to go from here to here. We want to go through P2, but we don't want to use the link between P2 and P3. So that's why as a result of this, the path will look like this. So how to implement this? Since all node seats are absolute labels, so the label values are the same on every node. If we simply push the label 222 in PE1, like in the use case one, the traffic will just follow the IGP short test path, will go ECMP two ways like this to PE2. So this is not what we want. So let's think about how we can actually steer the traffic through P2 and P5. Can we first steer the packet to P2 and then direct it further to P5? Yes, this is exactly the solution. For establishing this traffic engineering LSP, PE1 will need to post three labels instead of one label. The label stack should be 102, 105, 222, and 1234 is the service level. So we, we, we don't count this one. So you can see 102 is for arriving to P2. And then after that, P2 will remove 102, will pop 102, because this segment has been completed when it arrived to P2. And then after that, P2 will forward to P5 using the top level of 105. So 105 will expose to P5. Then because of P5 is the destination for 105, it means that the segment of 105 is completed. That's why P5 will pop 105 and then forward it further through the short test path to PE2. In this case, P6 does not remove 222. Instead, P6 will swap 222 to another 222 because P6 is not the destination of 222. So from P6 point of view, it is still on the way to the destination. That's why I just need to swap it. I will not pop it. This is how traffic engineering works in segment routing. And the traffic engineering path is directly encoded onto the packet by the head end using a stack of MPLS labels. This eliminates the need for signaling and state tracking in every node along the path. So all the routers along the path, they don't need to keep track of this LSP anymore, not like RSVPTE. If we are using RSVPTE, basically P1, P2, P5, P6 will need to have a status on the router to take note that there is an LSP traveling through it. But in this case, because we, we use the level stack like this, PE1 simply give the instruction on the packet header. So along the path, it will be just MPLS forwarding based on the level. There is no instruction needs to be stored in any router saying that this LSP exists. Okay, next, use case four is also about traffic engineering. The difference from use case three is that the point-to-point -point link between P5 and P6 now has an IGP metric of 100. Also, we will have adjacency seat in addition to the node seats in this use case. All seats are allocated and advertised with absolute labels because I want to try to make it simple. So I will use absolute labels to do the example here. Otherwise, if we are talking about index value, we need to calculate the index based on each router's range. All nodes are having the same SRGB range, so we use absolute levels. The objective is pretty much the same as use case three. But now since the IGP metric 
of the link between P5 and P6 is 100 now. So P5 short test path to PE2 is not through P6 anymore, but instead it is through P2 and P3. Remember previously in the previous example, we say that go to P2, then go to P5, and then go to PE2. It is okay because when it arrives to P5, P5 found that PE2 is through P6. This is okay. But in current example, when the metric is 100, then from P5's point of view, in order to go to PE2, it's no longer through P6 because here and here combined together will be 110. But going this way will be only 30. That's why P5 will loop the packet back to P2 if we don't do the additional instruction. That's why in this case, we need to make use of the another seed called adjacency seed. Adjacency seed, for example, from P5 to P6, we will define an adjacency seed of 1001, 1001 for this specific interface. So when we make use of this adjacency seed, it will simply tell P5 saying that regardless of your IGP metric or short test part, you simply push the traffic out through this interface to P6. Don't care anything, just push it out through this interface. Yeah, in case if we were to employ the same solution as use case three, it will happen like this. It will not go to six because the short test part from P5 is through P2 to P2. To solve this problem, we utilize the adjacency seed of 1001. Instead of pushing 102, 105, and 222, now PE1 need to push. Confirm your speaking language. Oh, what is it? I'm speaking in English. <laughs> Instead of pushing 102, 105, and 222, PE1 is now pushing 102, 105, and additionally, uh, 1001 here. There's one more level here. The 1001 followed by 105 is the adjacency seed for the point-to-point -point link between P5 and P6. When the packet arrives at P5, it will first pop 105, as it is the destination for this node seed. So basically, when the packet arrive to P5, for this part it is the same, so I did not repeat. When I arrive to P5, P5 will first remove 105 because it is the destination for 105. It means that the segment of 105 completed its mission, it arrives to P5. But next, it will process the adjacency seed of 1001 here. Then it will find out that this 1001 is referring to this link. So P5 will forward the packet through the link to P6, regardless of IGP metric and short test path. The whole instruction is like saying that P1 first, you should take the short test path to P2, then take the short test path from P2 to P5, then go through the P5's point to point link with P6, and then take the short test path from P6 to PE2. Let's see one by one. 102 means come to here first. 105 means after coming to here, go to P5. And then after arriving to P5, 1001 means go out through this interface. And then finally, 222 means you just take the short test path to PE2. Because from the P6 point of view, there is no other short test path besides this point to point link. So it will just go to PE2 this way. Use case five is also about traffic engineering but with the involvement of any cast seeds. All seeds are allocated and advertised with an absolute value because all nodes in the SR domain are having identical sRGB range. So this is the case of any cast. An any cast seed typically has one or more members. It allows ECMP aware short test path forwarding to the closest node of the any cast set. All the router in the anycast set advertise the same anycast prefix with the same label value. 
The goal of this use case is to ensure that traffic from PE1 to PE3 follows the top plan, specifically the anti-cast group A that has the seed of 100. So in this case, we can see we group these four routers as an anti-cast group A, and then we will assign a, a prefix for it and a seed for it. This seed is 100 means a1 also 100, A3 also 100, A2 also 100, and A4 is also 100. And then we don't care. Basically, we just want the traffic go through the top plan. No matter it is through A1 or A3 or A2 or A4, just go to the nearest one from the source. So in this case, we can use the anycast seed. To achieve this, PE1 can push the level stack of 100 and 113. The top level of 100 is the anycast seed of the anycast group A, indicates that the packet should take the shortest path to this anycast group A. So, yeah, 100 is for arriving to here. Because PE1 is nearest to A1, so it will arrive to here. But in case if PE1 is nearer to A4, then it will arrive to A4. It doesn't care which router the packet will arrive as long as one of these four routers. Upon the packet's arrival at the members of any cast group A, the receiving router will perform a pop operation. Yeah, because when the packet arrives, then the receiving router will see, hmm, this segment 100 is completed. It arrived to us already. So it will pop the label, removing the 100. And subsequently, the top label will become 113, representing the node seed of PE3. So it will send to PE3 with the short test part. The five use cases that we have just explored provide a practical demonstration of segment routing applications. Now, in this part of presentation, we will take a closer look at the details of traffic engineering within the context of segment routing. I'm sorry, I might take a little bit longer than the session time because now I see the time is 2.58, but I guess I might need to take uh, five or 10 minutes more for the presentation. So we will be a bit late to go to the break. So this part, we will talk about uh, traffic engineering within the context of segment routing. Traffic engineering, or TE, is an ability to steer the packet along specific paths that may not be the IGP short test path, based on a range of criteria such as IGP metric, TE metric, latency, loss, and link colors. An SLA, or service level agreement, is usually expressed as a desired business outcome it may also be referred as a service intent. And a color in the traffic engineering world is an OPEC quantity associated with an SLA or a service intent, which supports the realization of the SLA in the network. This is an example topology demonstrating an MPLS VPN service carrying traffic between CE1 and CE2 through the provider routers of PE1 and PE2. Let's assume that all the IGP metrics are 10 unless otherwise indicated. As shown on the diagram, technically there are three possible route, routing paths from PE1 to PE2. For example, the blue path below, this one, the blue path below, is the short test path from PE1 to PE2. This blue is a color name for us to identify a specific SLA or service intent. Besides the blue path, which on the diagram, there are another two paths, purple and red. The purple has more hops along the path, but it is a late, low latency path. The red is an example of traffic engineering path that has a constraint of using only the greens, the green links to establish the LSP. It may be a bit confusing here because blue, purple, red, and green all appear to be color. But you can see, in fact, the blue, purple, and red, they are the name of the SLA. The blue is the short test path, the purple is the low latency path, and then the red is the restricted path. 
that uses only the green link. And the green is a group name of the link. I know it is confusing, but the original author of the slide wrote like this. So I have to I have to present it this way. <laughs> okay, let's examine each of the paths. The blue path is the IGP short test path. This scenario is simple. Only a single transport level, which is the node seat of PE2, will be needed for establishing this LSP. Then the traffic will follow the ECMP aware short test path to the destination. This is quite simple. It is like the, the use case one that we did. It, it is the short test path. The purple one is traffic engineering low latency path. Although it traverses more intermediate nodes than the short test path, but its overall latency is lower than the short test path. Let's believe it is like this <laughs> because the, the diagram is saying like this. <laughs> okay. To establish the LSP for this low latency path, several seats will be required to override the short test path forwarding. The path is fully expressed as an order list of intermediate nodes plus the destination node. So totally, we will use three levels, 104, 105, and 222, which are the node seats of P4, P5, and PE2. So you can see 104, 105, 222 means Go this way, this way, then this way. It is a traffic engineering path. While a full list of segments will work, there is a way to slightly optimize the segment list. Instead of having three levels, the segment list can actually use only two levels. Now we are talking about the possible optimization. Instead of using three levels, we can use only two levels like 105 and 222 which are the node seats of P5 and PE2, because the short test path from PE1 to P5 will be through P4 anyway. So the level of P4 is not required in this case. I mean, technically we can put 104, 105, 222, but it is not required because the only way for PE1 to go to P5, the short test path is through P4. That's why we can directly say that, hey, PE1, you take the short test path to P5, then from P5, take the short test path to 222. This is the optimization that we can do. The last one in our example here is the red path. It is a traffic engineering path that uses only green links, which are the PE1 to P1, P1 to P2, P2 to P3, and P3 to PE2 link. Well, Personally, I feel it might make more sense to call this a green path than a red path because it is using green links, right? Anyway, the original author of this presentation wrote this. So let's move on with the red LSPs that uses the red LSP that uses the green links. Similar to the previous purple path, the level stack of this red path can include all node seats along the path. So PE1 will push 101, 102, 103, and 222. 101 is P1, and then 102 is P2, and then 103 is P3, and then uh, 222 is PE2. Totally four transport levels. But is it necessary to have all the four node seats along the path? Can this be simplified? Think about it. Yes. We can use an optimized segment list with only two levels, 102 and 222, which are the node seats of P2 and PE2. So that PE1 will take the short test path to P2 first, then take another short test path from P2 to PE2. In this optimization, we remove two levels. We remove the level of P1 and P3. And we kept only P2. Think about that. Why is the node seat of P2 required in the segment list? Why can't we remove P1 or P3? Can we? Can we remove P1 or P3? Can, can, we, can we keep P1 or P3 and then remove P2? If we use P1, 
instead of P2, from PE1 to P1 is fine. Yeah, because from PE1 to P1, they are directly connected. So this will be the short test part. This is fine. But from P1 to PE2, it's not sure that it will go this way. Because from P1, it can go one hop, two hop, three hop, or it can go one hop, two hop, three hop to PE2. So that's why if we use only P1, then it will have the equal cost path. And for the case of using P3 also will have similar problem. From P3 to PE2 is fine. From P3 to PE2, it is directly connected. It should be okay. But from PE1 to P3, then this is not sure. It has one path, one hop, two hop, two, three hop like this. It has another part, one hop, two hop, and then three hop. So it has ECMP from PE1 to P3. That's why P2 is the only intermediate node that can make sure the traffic forwarding stays on the green links after optimization. To realize the traffic engineering routing behaviors, there are a few solutions that can be used, like SR policy, flag algo, and seamless MPLS. SR policy provides capability to construct intent aware paths in both intra domain and inter domain environment. Flex algo or flexible algorithm allows us to create separate topologies that can be used for path calculations. It is an IGP feature and therefore it focuses primarily on intra domain routing. Seamless MPLS is a scalable solution utilizing BGP level unicast for integrating multiple IGP domains as a single end-to-end -end MPLS domain. In the case, let's say you have a segment routing domain, and then you have an LDP domain, and then you would like to connect these two together, then Seamless MPLS is one solution. So later in this presentation, I also will talk about the interworking between SR and LDP, it will be the next part of this presentation. But I think maybe before that, before the next part of the presentation, I will just quickly finish this traffic engineering part and then we will have a break first. Just now we talk about optimization. Why is it important to optimize the segment list? Because each hardware platform typically has its limitation on how many levels can be imposed or processed without having significant performance impact to the forwarding. This limitation is known as maximum segment depth or MSD. It is important to understand the MSD while computing the segment list. There are some mechanisms to re reduce the size of the segment list and they are critical to ensure that the network is able to support the traffic engineering part. So that's why Technically, we can use a full list of segments, but ideally, we should optimize. Then it will avoid the situation that maybe the hardware platform cannot support so many levels. Depending on the network setup, the MSD can be signaled to the controller using a few methods. The first one would be through Path Computation Element Communication Protocol, or PCEP, if it is used between head and router and the controller. In the case the controller does not speak PCEP, technically it is possible to let the controller participate in the network's IGP so that MSD information in the link state database will be visible to it. However, this option is not recommended as all IGP events will also be visible to the controller. And the controller may directly impact to the stability of IGP if anything is wrong with it. So we don't recommend to let the controller join the IGP and become part of it. Alternatively, we can use MPBGP with link state address family, known as BGP link state or BGP LS, which can re advertise the MSD values that the IGP advertised to the controller. This option is more scalable thanks to the support of route reflection and also out of band setup that BGP can offer. Imagine we have multiple IGP domains in our network. We just need to have one BGP LS router in each of the IGP domain. Then all of them can peer to a centralized and out-of-band route reflector. 
this route reflector will re-advertise everything else to the controller. By the way, PCE here on the diagram stands for part computation element. It is the controller that we are talking about. So when you are using controller, instead of letting the controller participate in every IGP, this can be the solution. Use BGP to re-advertise the MSD information, and then you can make use of the route reflection. And this route reflector can be our fan. It doesn't have to be in the network path. It can be a server somewhere else. To enable traffic engineering capability, IGPs like OSPF and ISIS are updated to support traffic engineering extensions that are created to advertise additional information for the computation of the TE paths. This information is used for the routers in the network to construct the TE database. Besides the base information, there are also traffic engineering metrics extension that can further distribute performance information of the network such as latency packet loss because in igp we only distribute the metric of the link but with this extension then it can distribute further with some other information like latency and percentage of packet loss here is a list of traffic engineering extensions that have been defined for ospf v2 and isis you may find out more details about them by reading the RFC listed at the right column of the table. And here is another list for traffic engineering metric extensions that have been defined for OSPF v2 and ISIS. The metric extensions for OSPF v2 were defined in RFC 7471. And for ISIS, you can refer to RFC 8570. Talking about traffic engineering extensions, RSVPTE was originally the only consumer of the TE attributes, but now it is no longer the case because now we have segment routing. And because segment routing like SR policy and flag algo also need to make use of the TE attribute, therefore TE extensions are now required to support multiple applications with the capability of indicating which applications are using the link attribute advertisement on the link and advertising the application specific values for the same attribute on the link. Basically, with this extension, we can achieve, like in Flag Algo, we can have multiple topologies for different purposes. Let's say you have uh, 20 routers in the network, you can create a topology for low latency with 10 routers in it, and then you can create another topology for the high throughput with, let's say, 12 routers in it. You can have different topologies with the support of this extension. As a result of this requirement, RFC 8919 and RFC 8920 introduced the application specific link attributes or ASLA for OSPF and ISIS respectively. By the way, for all the RFC that I mentioned along the way of presentation, in fact, I listed them in the references here at the last part of the presentation. So if you would like to read more about the RFC, actually all are listed here. Anyway, before we continue to the last part of the presentation, I think it is time to let everyone have a break because we are 14 minutes late. So now uh, we will have a break and I will continue at 3.30 again for the last part of the presentation and also the lab for the segment routing. Hope to see you all again at 3.30. And for the people who did not pick up the socks, we have some more available here, along with some few pens and some of my business cards. Okay, thank you very much for joining this session. Also, for any of you who did not check into the session, please check into the session to confirm your participation of the session. Thank you. <laughs> 